Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, hope you're having an awesome uh, couple of days of learning and connecting. Uh, my name is Steve Isaacs. I'm one of the curators for the Games and Learning track. Uh, and I have been fortunate enough to know Bron Stuckey, Lisa Castaneda, and Paul Darvasi through most of my journey in game-based learning. I was first introduced to Lisa when we were many, many years ago, I think, both uh, asked to present the work we were doing on Portal 2 in our respective classrooms. Um, and now Lisa is the CEO of Foundry 10, a research foundation with a focus on non-traditional approaches to learning. And Bron Stuckey, aside from being a personal friend, is an international leader in the area of game-based learning and somebody that I've always looked to as a mentor. And then there's Paul Darvasi. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, Paul blew us all away um, when we first saw him present the work on the Word Game, an alternate reality game he created for his second semester senior boys who were pretty much checked out and uh, needed to, to follow the journey of uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, Paul's work with games and learning is groundbreaking, as you're going to hear, and it is an absolute honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Paul and then Lisa and Bront. Thank you for that very generous uh, introduction, Steve. So I don't have a lot of time, and I, and I have so much to say, so I'm going to kick right into it. Uh, my name is Paul Darvazi. I'm a, I'm a high school English and media studies teacher. I'm also a researcher and doctoral candidate. And what I'm going to share with you today is the substance of my doctoral work. Um, and I call it Grand Theft Auto Ethnography, How Adolescents Critically Engage with Race, Gender, Violence uh, in the Mid Streets of Los Santos. And what, what I'm going to discuss is both of research interest, but for me, more important than the research, it's of classroom interest. How many of you are teachers here? Fantastic. That's great. Um, uh, the, the much of, uh, uh, well, a degree of what I'm going to discuss with you is not going to make it to my doctoral thesis, which is largely focused on race. So the gender stuff and the violence stuff, I'm, I'm really just discussing from a classroom media literacy perspective. Um, so a few things. How many of you have played Grand Theft Auto? Five. <coughs> wow. Uh, this, is, this is like every classroom I ever go to. How many of you have played Grand Theft Auto? Five. And then 75% of the kids put their arms up. Uh, this is, uh, I teach at an all-boys school, so that, that would be the reason. Excellent. So I have to admit I'm not a huge fan of the game. Not, not because I'm offended by it or anything like that. It's just not my kind of game. I, I prefer Red Dead Redemption and Red Dead Redemption 2. That's more my cup of tea. Uh, but but I, I have an incredible amount of admiration for the technical feat uh, that this game represents and the narrative feat. So just some facts and figures about uh, Grand Theft Auto. Released 2013. Uh, up until re it, it broke a sales record at the time of a billion dollars in three days. There have been over 100 million copies sold, and I'm sure this figure is out of date from when I wrote it a week ago because they, they, they keep flying off the shelf. Um, generated over $6 billion worth of revenue. Uh, it's produced in the UK, and it recreates Los Angeles. And this is very important, which it calls Los Santos for the purposes of the game, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss why that is of importance. Um, it's actually, according to the Guinness Book of, World's Re of World Records, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, the most controversial game of all time. So it, it's actually, it's officially the most controversial game of all time. The primary target of the game, the way the game is marketed, and it's very difficult to get any reliable demographics around the game, are white adolescent boys, or maybe a white adolescent boy mentality. Although um, there's a huge... Uh, there's a huge range of players. Uh, they tend to be male. They tend to be adolescent or within a certain age group. And this is very important for the research, which I will explain why shortly. Uh, this is a quote from Kurt Squire, one of the pe few people that has done research in this area. And he said, one of the most uh, dominant media franchises of the new millennium and a cornerstone media uh, point for millions of you today's youth. So the importance of this quote is, this is not a trivial thing that I focused on this game. It's a game that kids are playing, you know, potentially tens and tens of millions of kids, and we know nothing about how they're processing the game, how they're interacting with the game, nor have we supplied them with any kind of a critical apparatus to think about this game in a meaningful way. That doesn't mean they don't think about the game in a meaningful way, we just don't know, right? It's a, it's a huge black box. Um, so the first thing is, this is really interesting, they have the technology to recreate Los Angeles as it is. They could, uh, you know, Rockstar could no problem recreate every alley and corner of LA as it is. And they actually do a fairly reasonable facsimile of this. 
But their objective was not to recreate LA as it is. Their objective was to recreate Los Angeles as it is represented in the media. Because most people who play the game are in fact not from Los Angeles, and the sense of authenticity is felt in the way that it's represented in the media as opposed to the genuine Los Angeles. And this is very important. And when you talk about race in the game, that is the same thing. The representations of the uh, underserviced sort of ghetto neighborhoods in the game come from uh, how they're represented in hip hop videos and black exploitation films as opposed to the way that they are in real life. And this is a very deliberate strategy used by the game so that the white adolescent males who don't have direct experience with these realities will recognize them as authentic. So there's a huge irony in that. Um, it's not all bad. So for those of you, most of you have played it, so you know that you can do such things as yoga, tennis, golf, darts, cycling, jet ski, parachute hunting, triathlons. You can become a real estate mogul, play the stock market, watch movies or TV shows, cruise and listen to the radio, ride amusement park rides and sightseeing. It's a playground. And many of my students, the ones that I use for the study, use it as a playground. You know, many of them will just kind of, you know, they're, 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 they just want to relax, so they'll get into a car that they hijack, and uh, they'll <laughs> sort of turn on the radio and cruise down Pacific Coast One as the sun is setting and listen to nice music and relax. It's not all about hijacking and violence, although the game does drive you in that direction. Um, as I said, there's very little research in this area. I mean, I have scoured the databases for my own work, and, and there's almost nothing on Grand Theft Auto V. Most of my background research comes from other games or previous uh, editions in the franchise, and even there, there's not a lot in terms of user experience. So, uh, it w as you can imagine, schools are not running to put this game on their curriculum, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and, and it's exactly the opposite of what a school wants to do, in fact. And, and somebody may be under the impression that, that, you know, this is something I did to be subversive or to draw attention to myself, like, hey, I put GTA 5 in the schools. It isn't. Absolutely not. I was drawn to this for long and complicated reasons. Like I said, I'm not a huge fan of the game. The fact that it was controversial, I cannot tell you the amount of manipulating, lying, and convincing I had to do to get this game in front of my students, right? <laughs> and, and, and it almost didn't make it. And in the end, uh, I had the support of the parents for the students that I used it with, and that was the, the, the final sort of okay. Because in, in my school, the parents run the show. If the parents were okay with it, then this allowed me to put the, the game uh, in the class with my students, because this is kind of the reaction I was met with uh, when I first, and it, and it caused controversy. I mean, there were, I had colleagues cry, and, and they never played the game. They just had read about it in the paper, and they were very upset that this was coming in. And all, so it really, it really did create a bit of a stir uh, when I brought it in a few years ago. The reason I use this is because I'm a media literacy guy. I teach media studies. I'm a, I'm a disciple of Marshall McLuhan. And, and to discuss gender and race uh, and violence uh, with these, this particular demographic, it's about meeting them where they are. And, and very rich conversations emerged because they were so excited to talk about race and gender within a realm that they were familiar with. Uh, and, and as a result, this project really stems from that. And of the, uh, the 11 participants in my study, uh, 10, or the 10 participants, nine had already played. I had to introduce it to one of the participants, which I wasn't altogether comfortable with, but nobody really had a problem with that. Uh, so the objectives of the study initially were to better understand how white adolescent boys play and relate to GTA V and provide a critical apparatus by which to filter their gameplay experience. So I had both hats on my researcher hat and my teacher hat. So I want to gather data about something which we know very little about. I wanted to gather rich data. Yes, it's a small sample size, but it's more about depth than breadth in terms of the research that I was doing. And that's really important because there's not a lot out there, right? And, and the other thing is, I wanted this not just for it to be kind of a, a greedy data gathering experience for me as a researcher, I wanted to have, and these are, these are, this is a big word and it rarely occurs, I wanted them to have a transformative experience. How do, I, how do I maintain my objectives as a good teacher while I'm doing this? I'm going to have to rush here because I'm already running out of time. Um, so I, the, I was a teacher researcher, 10 participants, 17 and 18 years old, nine had already played. We did it over 11 class sessions and 30 days. 
My students were co-researchers. I trained them as, ethnographer, as ethnographers for them to go into the game and gather information for me, which is uh, what resulted in their autoethnographies. They played GTA 5 at home. We actually didn't play the game in class. We, did, we discussed it, we looked at articles, we did all kinds of other stuff in class, but the game was played at home. Theoretical underpinnings. I'm, I'm looking at my work through a post-colonial lens. I'm drawing from the tradition in cultural studies, cultural anthropo uh, anthropology, critical media literacy, critical pedagogy, and uh, dialogic learning. All of these inform my practice and my research in various ways. If you ever want to sit down and talk about it, I will bore you to death about all of the details. So ethnography was at the heart of this, right? I, I, it was an ethnographic project, and um, which is very fertile. Now, this is when we think of ethnographers, we think out in the field, kind of a white colonial figure going in and, and intervening uh, in, in, in indigenous life of some sort. In this case, this is my field, right? It's the living room, it's the bedrooms where uh, they were playing the game, but also, interestingly enough, it's also here. It's inside of the game, it's in the space of the game, which is just as real, if not more real and more significant during the study, which is really fascinating. So this is, this is where we were in the study. Um, autoethnography is a branch of ethnography where you sort of audit yourself, you write, and you position yourself as the participant within a cultural context. I gave them the rudiments for them to understand what ethnography is, what autoethnography is, and they took their own field notes during their gameplay process, and we're very mindful of their gameplay as a result of that. So it had a, a, benef a benefit uh, pedagogically as well as from the research perspective. Um, I took field notes about our discussions in class. They took field notes about their, their experiences in the game. I videotaped all of our classes, all 11 classes, where we sat around 75 minutes in a circle dialoguing about various elements of the game. I then transferred those field notes, hand wrote, all of the transcripts for those, all of the little nuances that I gathered, and it was absolutely fascinating. I could write like 300 papers from the stuff that, that, I, that I pulled out of it. Um, aside from that, we created a larger ecology of information by using social media. So what I did is I started a Facebook group. We were all participating in it. They would post screenshots. I would prompt them for information. And they would voluntarily prompt videos or images or information that were relevant to their gameplay experience. And all of that became part of my data as well. And it was incredibly rich. This was actually one of the best things that we did because so much unintentional, informal type learning stuff uh, went into the Facebook group. We also created a dialogic uh, structure where we sat in a circle. We discussed openly. I wasn't the sort of sage on the stage. I sat there, listened to them, would provoke them with articles and ideas about race and gender and violence in the game, and listened to what they had to say about the game. And they could not say enough. They loved talking about experiences. They were completely honest. There was no judgment in terms of you swore, you did what. I just listened. And, 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 I, and I would provoke and listen and provoke. And so much valuable information, many of it was very surprising, came out over the course of it. This is a bit of the structure of a dialogic structure or a Harkness structure versus a traditional structure. For those of you that are teachers and you can manage with classes under 20, look up Harkness discussions. It's one of the best things you can do as a teacher. I, I learn so much about my students when I take a step back and structure these kind of dialogic models and let them take over with some preparation in advance. Very, very powerful instructional method. Um, I also am very, uh, you know, this is very much positioned in what is called critical media literacy. And this is a politicized form of media literacy. It, 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 I definitely have a particular political agenda when I'm doing this project. You know, it's about gender, it's about race, it's about a perspective on that. And it really comes down to basic human rights and social justice. And that is the tradition of critical media literacy. Very important. Highly recommend you implement it in your practice. What's really interesting about GTA 5, it was invented by, by, by very clever uh, Scottish brothers, and that they had no obligation to be kind to the United States. And what, what many players don't notice is the whole game is a giant critique of the American dream. It is layered in irony. And many players miss it, to be honest with you. Not all of them, but many do. So it excuses itself on some level by saying, hey, we do this awful stuff, but it's actually making fun of the awful stuff that's really going on. So in the, in the tradition of Jonathan Swift, uh, they're, they're, they're really creating a social critique out of the game. Unfortunately, it is often missed. So in terms of racial representation, I, I can't get into too much detail, but where I've landed is there's an incredible, in the United States and in Canada to some degree, 
there's a form of urban segregation that occurs, right? And there's a whole reason for this in terms of banking policies and social policies that have, that have created what we call the ghetto, right? And there's an association, a very close association with race and place. And the game being in some ways a reproduction of Los Angeles reinscribes that notion of race and place. And it was fascinating to see how the players were really um, perpetuating and enacting those elements of race and place and reinscribing ideas about race and place without really understanding the reasons why. And that's why it's important to create a critical apparatus around it to really be mindful of the social circumstances that have led us to where we are today. Um, we also looked at gender representation. And in some ways, there is some, you know, the irony to some way excuses race. There are some underlying elements that, that I think that, that, that can explain away some of the racial representation. I don't think it happens with gender. Uh, I, the, the, the representation of women in the game is horrendous, uh, and, and it's, been, you know, it's been talked about a lot, and, and it was really important for them to see this. And for many of them, it was a wake-up call. They're really great kids that just had to wake up to the fact that you are thinking about things a certain way because of the media that you consume. And of course, this extends now to all media, not just media within the game. And because they were all boys, we talked a lot about the notion of hegemony and hegemonic masculinity and the various ways that there is to be a man and how limited our views of manhood were within the realm and structure of the game. And again, it's an incredible learning experience because many of them started interrogating their own masculinity, and this came out in the autoethnographic projects, and really created a lot of mindfulness about things that they otherwise would not have unpacked if they hadn't played the game. So what are some results? Well, there's, there's a lot to talk about. What I was most fascinated by, you know, this is, this is, it's not, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. They live in media. They live in media. When you're in GTA, it's a model of that. They live in media in GTA, but when they discuss race, their substance for racial discussions are Django Unchained, and they pull theory from dear white people, right? So they're using media to discuss media about media when they're in media. They're an entirely mediated universe, right? And this is really important to understand, to understand our adolescents. This is where they're drawing their theories and their content. And in many ways, that's one of the things that GTA 5 and their makers are very aware of because they create this entire media construct to reproduce the reality that the adolescents that they're appealing to live in in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, they were, because they were trained as autoethnographers, they were trained in scholarly thinking, which was really an important byproduct of it. Uh, they better understood the research process. They're more mindful of race, gender, politics, uh, in games, media, and life. All of this was, was visible through the data, that they all of a sudden were awakened to many things that very educated, uh, you know, very well-intentioned young men uh, had just implicitly held these ideas that weren't unpacked uh, under other circumstances. Sorry. Um, so some of the things uh, that, that came up were they used the game to role play. You know, a kid, he, had my, he was my social justice warrior. This kid, honestly, he made me feel embarrassed of myself. And, and he loved to play a psychopath in the game. <laughs> loved it, right? And you start thinking, oh, that's really disturbing. And he was very honest about his behavior inside of the game. But I do think there's a clear division that's made from the behavior in the game and, and this kind of role playing element. Uh, they experimented with identity. They would take on different identities within the game. And even within a character who has a more or less structured identity, they would play around with that role uh, in the game, which again is not, is not uh, surprising. It's a way to blow off steam. You know, one kid, I always remember, he was going home and a car kind of drove by him and splashed him, which is the most frustrating thing as an urban dweller. That's happened to me many times. I just want to murder somebody when that happens, so I could go home and murder somebody, right? And that's exactly what they do. And he felt, well, after about an hour, I felt so much better playing the game. The argument, too, is, well, maybe you would have felt better after an hour anyway, right? And that, it's kind of hard to determine. But they definitely talk a lot about releasing frustration and anxiety in the game. They bonded with others, not just playing together, but there was this kind of capital about those that were the most experienced players versus those that weren't. And they observed over and over again that there was this bond between the most experienced players and the ones that weren't would kind of fold their arms and sit back and feel like they were out of the club. So it creates a degree of cultural capital and currency uh, between them. Um, OK, so I'm out of time completely. It says three minutes. OK, so uh, that's basically it. Uh, Reinscribed associations with race and place. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, 
Um, this work that we're currently doing came out of a lunchtime conversation this time last year at Games for Change, <laughs> uh, when we realised our agendas were colliding, um, and we'll tell you a lot more about that. So just briefly, so I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Foundry 10, which is a philanthropic educational research organization. We're based out of Seattle, Washington, and our goal is to really think about how to expand the ways in which people think about learning. But as we're doing that, we have a big focus on whether or not the research or programs or things that we're collaborating on are actually having a positive direct impact on kids. So one of the areas that we've been really interested in over the past years has been games and simulations and virtual reality, which is what I'm going to speak to today. Okay, and my work has been in, uh, particularly uh, of recent days, has been in Minecraft or virtual worlds. I worked with the Quest Atlantis program for 12 years out of Indiana University and ASU and then moved into Minecraft and um, looking at case study research of classrooms using Minecraft in Australia and around the world. Um, and that's been significant in terms of the things that I've noticed and that Lisa and I've come together on. And we're trying to rush through all this <laughs> because we um, you know, have so much to tell you. So we're just going to give you just a quick glimpse of the data because we've both been gathering different types of data and we're hoping that they're relevant and kind of spark some ideas in your head about the topic today, <laughs> which is going to be how we're gathering evidence for the learning that's occurring through these games and simulations. Okay, so many, many classrooms have adopted virtual worlds over the years and there are people in this room that I know from Second Life, Open Sim, Quest Atlantis, number of different other programs. And I know that the licensing for Minecraft makes it the biggest licensed game in the world, but it isn't necessarily the biggest played game in the world. And there is, um, what we're finding in education is that while licenses are out there and in my country, um, one state in Australia has licensed 660,000 licenses of Minecraft Education Edition, um, but we're not seeing 660,000 students using it. And so that we're not jumping the chasm from those early adopters in virtual worlds and virtual technologies. And part of what we're seeing, might, the problem might be in the evidence that teachers are gathering in their classrooms. Sorry. <laughs> So at Foundry 10, we've been studying virtual reality in classrooms for the past five years. And when we first started, we were really interested in like, how do you even implement this? And our questions just had to do with the functional like classroom management of VR in classrooms. And it evolved over the past years. We looked at content. We looked at how do you know this is creating value? And last year, we did a study with 22 teachers across the United States in a variety of different classrooms. And we really started to notice that no one was talking about assessment of learning. So they're putting VR in here and we're like, how do you know that this is actually improving student learning? So of our 22, only three utilized some <coughs> sort of assessment to actually look at how this virtual reality content as implemented into the curriculum benefited students. And what we found was one of the big hurdles was people were really stuck on what kind of assessments would you use to look at learning in VR. I mean, you could put a quiz in VR, but that's not really tapping into the technology in the way we probably want to. So what does assessment even look like? Additionally, if you wanna go ahead and go to the next slide, one of the things that we found this year, we did a case study of six classrooms, because after we found out that nobody was really thinking about assessment, we were like, let's go out and find some teachers who are actually thinking about this. We started the study in September. Even with six experienced teachers using VR, we weren't getting any data till February, because all sorts of weird things come up when you're trying to put VR into your curriculum. There's still huge issues with just technology. Finding content is still an issue for folks. Um, and so even once they were starting to get it up and running, assessment didn't work the way that they imagined. So our study didn't work the way that we imagined, and we're just now getting the data from it, but it's bringing a lot of interesting questions up about how we're even utilizing these technologies in practice. And that really resonates with what we're seeing happening, for instance, in Minecraft Education Edition, that teachers are uh, moving into it with clear goals set for why they might be bringing it into the curriculum, but along the way, um, they lose sight of those goals and in some ways are being seduced by the technology to, um, to a, a level of engagement that doesn't move forward for, with the learning. 
so a few of the implications, we're going to hit you with a slide that has a lot of text, but we'll talk through it here. So what, speaking of engagement, that's one of the big things that we hear. Um, when we survey students, when we talk to teachers, engagement is a huge word, and it's very, very important. But it doesn't necessarily give us any information about what the kids are taking away from that experience. Um, so one of the quotes I have here at the top, this came from our very first year of our study when we looked at VR, and one of the students was like, whatever you do, please don't mess up VR by bringing it in school. And so one of the things we think about is that these technologies, they, they come with some pressure. A lot of times kids feel like when you bring technology into the classroom, it's not used like you use it outside of the classroom. So teachers want to honor the VR and do interesting things with it. But at the same time, we're in a school setting and we need to know what students are taking away from it. Um, this quote on the second line here, my assessment was simply whether or not students wanted to keep doing VR. That was a direct quote from a student in last year's, or a teacher in last year's study. Again, uh, that speaks to engagement. It speaks to the fact that students were enjoying um, this activity, but it's not telling us whether or not being immersed in Pearl Harbor VR actually added to their knowledge of Pearl Harbor in any way better than if they were reading about it or watching a video. And similarly in Minecraft, what we found was that people were engrossed in the engagement. And that's the low-hanging fruit we want, we want yes. to talk about <laughs> that was the title of our um, presentation. And not to decry engagement, it's vitally important, but we don't stop, shouldn't be stopping at engagement as the only point we're asking of this technology. Because it's a huge investment, not just the dollars you put into buying equipment or licenses, but in the teacher's time to craft this technology into the curriculum and to make it totally relevant. So we need better evidence. And what we're finding, uh, similarly to what Lisa found, was that people are describing engagement, cooperation, mentoring, all laudable things, but what about the maths they started with as the objective for learning using this technology? Or the urbanisation in, in uh, urban, building in urban environments or you know whatever the topic was or, and the uh, learning objectives that they started with. And so that was seemed to be falling by the wayside and for the most part teachers couldn't t tell you how the game or the game experience contributed to the student learning. What impact did it have on the student learning? Does that impact match the investment that you've put in to bringing it into the classroom? And in Minecraft particularly, we find people become seduced by the build and it becomes product focused. So teachers were describing the, val the, the massive builds kids did or you know, uh, how it, other people enjoyed their builds or showing their builds to parents. Now those are all fabulous things, but they weren't then mapping that back to the curriculum objectives that they had when they started. So it becomes um, a description of soft skills, all of which are vitally important, but they didn't bring it in to develop soft skills. They brought it in to develop math knowledge or science or literacy. So these things seem to be falling off the wagon. So that we can bring something up that's like a positive example. I wanted to bring this. This is from one of the teachers that we had this past year in our assessment study where they actually used VR as the assessment. So rather than prepping kids by putting them in a virtual experience or having them play a game, they actually, it was a Spanish class, high school students, they actually had students learn vocabulary, do practice drills, and their assessment, which they had a rubric for that the teacher scored, was how effectively in Spanish they were able to play keep talking so nobody explodes and get out of the room with the bomb. And so it was a really interesting way to rethink this whole idea of how a virtual space could be used in assessment. And we were able to get student feedback. And for the most part, it was positive. Some of the kids felt like it was kind of a high pressure scenario um, to be assessed in um, disarming a bomb, which uh, makes sense. But uh, for the most part, we found it was a really interesting way to kind of look at this. So um, moving on here, we wanted to, to kind of think about what are some steps that we can be taking? Um, because when we go and talk with teachers or we're out in the classroom, again, a lot of times with teacher-oriented conferences, it's all about bringing games and bringing these tools in. And there's not often, I mean, assessment's not a super sexy topic, so it doesn't often go to how do we know that these tools are what, doing what we want them to do. So really, we would like to encourage people to think about the affordances of the tool. What is it about Minecraft that's really going to add value for your learning objectives? Or is VR the proper tool that's actually going to enhance learning? 
what kind of teaching strategies can you be leveraging so that you can actually reach the learning goals? Again, we think about these as tools. We're actually at Foundry Time, we're working on a paper right now called, did you really need VR for that? Because there are times where yeah. you probably don't actually need VR. Yeah, the answer to every lesson is not Minecraft, right? Yeah. And I'm a huge fan and there are many fans in the room, but it's not the appropriate tool for every lesson. And sometimes assessment's just a loaded term. So what if we think about that in terms of gathering evidence of student learning and taking more of a scientific approach to it? And then finally, we should all be able to reflect back of how the adoption of this technology really enhanced the learning goals. And so to match our interest, we discovered the work of Liz Kolb. Do any of you know of her work in, in, the, in the E's? And uh, interestingly enough, she describes engagement as the bottom of her ease and, you know, that people do become trapped there. But something she raised that Lisa and I both found resonated was sometimes that engagement is not with the curriculum content but with the tool itself. And so we're being blinded by that and saying, yes, the kids were very engaged, but was it engaged with, what, with the learning content, with the academic content? And so she looks at moving further into enhance and extend the learning. And part of what we're hosting in our discussion tomorrow is to look at whether these E's are useful for us in looking further into hosting that deeper discussion about engagement and learning. And so you can see there described the, the high points of her three E's for engagement. And we don't have the time to spend a, a long time on those, but they're the core of what we're looking at. And we're trying to build a framework that will help teachers understand how they need to look at the affordances of the tools, but start always with your learning objective. It all comes back to your students and their learning needs. And from that point, we move on to looking at the, the affordances of tools. Does this particular tool match the learning objective that I have? Don't start with Minecraft and say, where can I cram it into the <laughs> curriculum? Or VR, I have VR, the school spent this money, I have to use it. It's not the right way to go. And so then mapping it over the learning strategies that will be appropriate for your learning objectives and the affordance of the tool. And so that's really the high point. That's why it's the top step in that rung is because how a teacher frames a technology in the classroom is what makes all the difference. So, you know, um, it, that's vital. And then looking at how you've, how have you pushed it in those three E's? Have you pushed it and it to extension of the learning? Because the tool has to do better than what you're already doing or why invest in it? And then looking at the end, how do you assess that in a way that honours the four steps that went before? And how do you, and how do you um, evaluate the role or the impact the technology had? And that's really the step that's the hardest to reach and the hardest to have a conversation at. And what we're doing is trying to work through a framework that describes <coughs> that. So, we crammed a lot in here. So if you'd like to have a further conversation while we have our information, and then tomorrow, um, we are hosting an end game assessment summit. So it's actually a couple of hours of time spent with a bunch of folks kind of talking about and thinking about how these things can work in practice. Uh, put your hand up if you're already coming. Some of you in this room are already attending Yay. tomorrow. Fantastic. Um, it's 9.30 to 12 in the Microsoft flagship, and we are in the executive suite at the top of the building. <laughs> uh, refreshments and food are provided, and a deep, deep dive into the conversation on assessment and evaluation in virtuality. Great. Thank, Thank you. you.